Welcome everyone back to our final day of the Spark Writing Festival. So it has been a wonderful week of getting to see people, getting to participate in workshops. Um, the response has been beyond what any of us could have expected or hoped for. I am really excited today to have Patty Callahan Henry with us. So Patty Callahan Henry is a New York Times and USA Today best-selling author of 15 novels, including Becoming Miss Lewis. The Improbable Story of Joy Davidman and C.S. Lewis, written as Patty Callahan. In addition, she is a recipient of the Christie Award, a 2019 Book of the Year, the Harper Lee Distinguished Writer of the Year for 2020, and the Alabama Library Association Book of the Year for 2019. Patty Callahan is a co-creator and co-host of the weekly web show and podcast Friends in Fiction, featuring the five best-selling authors, Mary Kay Andrews, Christy Woodson Harvey, Kristen Harmel, and Mary Alice Monroe, with endless stories, special guests, and a way to connect readers and writers. A full-time author and mother of three children, she now resides in both Mountain Brook, Alabama and Bluffton, South Carolina with her husband. So, thank you guys so very much for joining us. Patty, take it away. It's so awkward to sit when people are talking about you. And, and I've got to change my bio where it says, where she's the mother of three children, it should be the mother of three adults. So my, my kids are, are grown and I'm a grandma. So that's crazy. I guess I should add that in my bio. But anyway, thank you for having me. Um, when Haley and I first started talking about this conference, it, it was a couple of years ago. And then again, at the Monroeville um, Alabama Writers Festival in March of last year, right before we tipped over into isolation. Ha Haley and I were just talking about, I think it's the last real gathering I was at. Um, I think you too. And we saw it coming, but it was just out of the corner of our eye. We didn't know what would happen. And the paperback for Mrs. Lewis was coming out. And I said, well, at least my next book won't be out during a pandemic. And, and it will be. So here we are. Um, I'm so happy to see y'all. And I, I just said that there's, there's so many great writers on here. And if you're here, hi, Don. Hi, Jen. I can see you in there. Um, I'd rather have a really good conversation. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what um, Haley asked me to talk about, but then I really wanna open it up for us to all talk and end this amazing conference with a conversation. But let me tell you a story. Um, now, don't you kind of lean forward when you hear that you wanna know more. Those are like catnip, it, it's crack for those of us who are writers. It was Pat Conroy who said that tell me a story were the most powerful words in the English language. And it's because we're made for story. Our brains are quite literally wired for story. So before I was a writer, I was a nurse and I used to work with head injuries and I used to work on the neuro floor and our brains are literally wired for story. Story is what our brain does. Our, our brain is a logic processor. It's, it's how we process our life. There are, are, I think, 86 billion, maybe 87 billion brain cells. And all of them are after one thing, control of our life. And story is one of the largest ways and the biggest ways and the most powerful ways that we control our life. Stories are who we are. Um, humans do things, especially lately, that we don't understand. And what do we do? We, we try to make a story about it because if we don't make a story about it, things feel meaningless. And for me, at least, things have felt very meaningless over the past nine to 10 months. Um, you can't quite make sense of what's unfolding in the world. And what we automatically do is make a story out of it. They're doing this because of this. This is what's happening. And we try to understand it by telling each other the stories of it. Um, that's how we make meaning out of our life. Studies show that what we think we want mentally is happiness, that you know the pursuit of happiness, that we need to go after happiness. But what some of the most in-depth psychological studies have shown is that it's actually not what we want because happiness is very fleeting. And we all kind of come back to our baseline of who we are. 
So we get the house we wanted or the award we wanted or the publication we wanted or the accolades we wanted. And we're happy for that moment. But then we all, human nature, kind of go back to whatever our baseline is. So happiness is fleeting. What we really want deep down is purpose and meaning. We want what we're doing with our life to have meaning. We want to wake up and have some purpose. And stories are one of the things that offer meaning and purpose. So how does that affect our writing? How does knowing that affect our writing? For me, not only does it affect my writing in that that's what I want to do with my days and my hours and whatever years I have left in my life, but also I want my writing to have some meaning and purpose. So I was a dork in high school and I took Latin while everybody else was doing cool things. I was taking Latin and going to Latin club meetings. And so I've always been fascinated by the genesis and the origin of words. And there are two words for words. One is logos and one is mythos. So we all know what logos is. Logos is logic. And we have to use those words to tell our stories. We have to logically have one thing happen and then another. But where stories have power, where we find purpose and meaning is in the word mythos. So yes, stories are made out of words, but all of us who are storytellers deal in the realm of mythos, especially for me, poets. Um, poetry is always something that I wished I could do and have no skill set to do. So my, my playground is in, in fictional stories, but the world of logic doesn't always apply in a poem, um, but we still know how it speaks to us and that's in the realm of mythos. Mythos is something timeless. It's a guiding narrative. We ask all the time, even if subconsciously, what is the meaning of my life? Why am I here? What is the purpose? And story and poetry, I think, try to answer that. Um, so if you want to write, I think the really good news is that you're already a storyteller because that's how we're built. That's how we're made. When you gossip, when you, not that you gossip, but when and if you ever did, that's storytelling. When you dream, our subconscious is telling us stories all the time. So deep down inside, we're born storytellers. Since the day people drew pictures on a cave wall, we have been telling each other stories. Like I said, even your subconscious does. So stories emerge from us naturally, and we just need to hone it if we want to write fiction. We have to build a toolbox. We have to find the skill set that we're more adept at than others. Yes, I want to write poetry, but you don't want me to write poetry. So we need to learn our toolbox. And that's what the classes are for. That's what these conferences are for. But at the same time, it, I think it's really important to remember, or for me to remember, that we actually are natural born storytellers. And that we need to tap into that and not get so caught up in that's not for me. When I first started writing, oh gosh, it was about, well, I mean, I've been writing since I could hold a crayon, but when I very first started writing about 20 years ago to, to try and actually write my first novel or first book, um, I wanted to believe that there was one rule or a set of rules that would tell me, or, or the just write writing book, Stephen King's on writing, Anne Lamott's Bird by Bird, you know, that there's an entire, that whole shelf right there is nothing but writing books. Um, and I still tap into them because they're still really important. But I figured one of those would tell me the exact thing I needed to know. Um, KK and I had, had were, went to the same writer's colony for a couple years, sadly and heartbreakingly, it's closed down. Um, I actually still dream about that place. That was a powerful place. But you know, I always thought maybe one of the writers there had had a secret clue for how how I could, you know, tap into a bigger and better story. So I'm here to tell you that there are no, there is not the one rule. 
Um, there is not one answer. There is no magic sauce. There is no secret. Um, if there is a secret, the secret is, is that there is no secret. So Somerset Maughan, who I never say that name right, was a famous English writer and playwright, I think in the 30s, right? 20s, 30s. But once said that there are three rules for writing a novel. Sadly, no one knows what they are. And I love that. So I decided after a couple of my books were out that I would write, that there was no way I could give you the three rules for writing. But I started to write down the things I wish I'd known before I started writing. And I have a huge list, but I'm gonna just throw out three of them and then we can just all have a conversation. I wish I had understood more about what I already loved, which is story. Stories have sustained me for all my life. I moved when I was really young. I used to hide in the library. Story has always sustained me. So I never gave a lot of thought, even when I first started writing, to what is a story. So if we were all in the same room right now, I would ask you to throw out your definitions of a story. Um, but the best one I've found is from a book called Story Genius. A story is about how the things that happen affect someone in pursuit of a difficult goal. And here's the clincher, the thing I always wish I'd known and was probably doing subconsciously and how that person changes internally as a result. A story is about how the things that happen affect someone in pursuit of a difficult goal and how that person changes internally as a result. So to break that down for me, what that is, is that there's almost this, this train track, these two rails that, that a story is traveling along. And one is what's happening, what the character wants and what they're pursuing and what they're going after. That's where we get our conflict. We all know that without conflict, there, there is no story. So that's one rail. But the second rail is how that person changes internally as a result of what we're putting them through as a result of all the conflicts that they're hitting and that they're crossing as they travel. And the more that we can make those two rails travel exactly next to each other, the better our train travels along this story rail. So I wish I had understood that from the very beginning. It's about the external conflict, but it's also about the internal growth and transformation. It's not as simple as a series of events. I remember when I first started writing, um, I, 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 had some, I won a contest and I had some interest from an agent. And essentially what she said was, you're a lyrical, beautiful writer. There's, no, there's nothing happening. And, and I was like, seriously? There's a whole story in there. There's 300 pages of a story in there. But there wasn't because I didn't understand that part. I didn't understand conflict. I didn't understand change fueled by desire with conflict. Um, I didn't understand really what a journey of transformation is. Um, another definition I love is that story is telling the truth in a story through conflict. So it isn't just poetic language, although I love that. And some of my favorite authors were once poets. But Ron Rash, for example, is a poet before he wrote novels. And um, there are so many beautiful poets that, that end up writing novels and their, their prose is, is some of my favorite, but they also understand the truth that a story is changed, fueled by desire with conflict and that there is an internal transformation as well as an overcoming of conflict. Because what our brain does is it says, we rev the brain, the reader's brain, into high gear when they say, oh, something is about to happen and change everything. Oh my gosh, something is about to happen and change everything. And the more we do that, the more we tap into our understanding of how our brains are wired, I think the more engaging our stories are. Because you're hooked before you know it when it looks like a change is going to happen, that something is going to change everything and, and flip somebody's world on end or even just flip their understanding on end. Um, one of my favorite definitions of stories is by a man you probably know I love, C.S. Lewis. And he says, to be stories at all 
They must be a series of events, but it must be understood that this series of events, the plot as we call it, is only a net whereby to catch something else. And I love that. And I contend that that something else is need, desire, theme, transformation, the story or the series of events, the plot is a net to catch all the other things. And that's the first thing I wish I had known when I very first sat down to write. The second is this kind of belief that probably came from, from being in medicine that I had to do it right the first time or not do it at all. Because in, in nursing school, there's only one dosage of a medicine that's not gonna kill someone. Like you can't just keep trying to do something. You can't just keep trying to get that right. You go to school to make sure that the next time you calculate a drug dose, you, you never get it wrong. And I had this, this kind of innate and unconscious, it was not a conscious thought, that I couldn't show my writing to anybody until I had it exactly right. And that is so far from the truth. There is something so beautiful about muddling through this together, about showing each other our work, about getting feedback, about figuring out as we go along. Because being a writer, for me at least, is about a journey. It is not this one and done, dust it and do it kind of thing. It is a nonstop journey and you do not have to do it right the first time to keep doing it. And the biggest third misbelief that I had was that the creative life and the real life are separate. When I first started, I had this real brick wall between my real life and my creative life. For a long while, I didn't tell anyone what I was doing to the point that when my first book came out in 2004, some of my closest friends were completely surprised and also hurt because I had been writing from 4.30 to 6.30 in the morning. When I went to conferences, I said I was going to something else. When I went to classes down at Emory, I lived in Atlanta at the time. I didn't tell them where I was going. And I just believed that I had to keep those two things separate. Part of it was because I felt like in saying I want to be a writer, I was saying I want to be an astronaut, that it was impossible and, and somebody might laugh. But the other reason was tied into the second belief was that I didn't want to tell anybody until I had it figured out, not realizing that in the writing life, you never have it figured out. And I think that's actually one of the best things. But I think that's where our lives must collide. Both got better when I took down that brick wall my quote real life and my quote creative life, both became richer and deeper and, and served me better, honestly, and the world better when I let the two of them mix it up because anything that we learn in life applies to our writing. And I contend that almost anything we learn about writing applies to our life. For, for example, what is one of the first things we learn when we start writing fiction? It's that our character has to want something, that the character really, really has to want something. The vaguer the want, the vaguer the story. The want, the desire drives the story. And there must be conflict in attaining that desire. I mean, I think it's the same for us. Our story is better when we know what we want, when we know our purpose. And we get to change our mind a lot too, but our desire last year might be a little bit than our desire this year. But as soon as I started letting those two worlds meld together, Haley and I were talking about this during the week on email, but also before y'all came on about how sometimes we feel guilty when we aren't working, when we aren't writing or at the desk. Stop, stop, full stop. We have enough guilt in our lives that like not feeling guilty for not writing if we're letting our lives our creative life and our real life merge together there's no guilt I have my biggest breakthroughs when I'm taking a dog for a walk or talking it out with a friend or staring out the window with my one too many cups of coffee during COVID and and it just we let our guard down 
and it floats to the surface because our subconscious is always working on the things that matter for us. So if there's a story that matters to us, it's, it's in there. We might dream about it. The thought might bubble to the surface, but if we are hardcore 24 seven chaining ourselves to a desk chair, which is also important button chair, but there, it's okay to let your, your lives merge together and not, not consider the creative life separate. And there are a lot of books that have helped me with that. But of course, one of the biggest, KK and I've talked about this a lot, is The Artist's Way. That book changed my life. So if, there's, if, if you're struggling at all with trying to figure out how to break free from what you think are two separate lives, I highly recommend The Artist's Way. So I believe that we transform our lives as we transform the lives of our characters. So let's talk. Tell me what y'all want to talk about. So I'm, I don't keep speaking into the void. Oh, good. It's 1030. Um, tell me what y'all want to talk about. Haley? Right. Well, um, I was wondering if you would talk to us a little bit about uh, the Friends in Fiction group that you have uh, going on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, because I know that that's been like really central to your pandemic time and everything. So can you tell us about that? Yeah, and I think that that feeds right back into that third misbelief we were just talking about, which is that we don't, you know, this idea that we keep our real life and our creative life separate. Um, and during when the pandemic started in March, I had a paperback, the paperback of Becoming Mrs. Lewis coming out, and I was going on this 12 city tour. And four of my other writer pals, Mary Kay Andrews, Mary Alice Monroe, Kristen Harmel, and Christy Woodson Harvey, they all had March, April, May, and May books coming out. And all of their tours got canceled. And we sat down and got on a Zoom together, honestly, to lament and wail and gnash our teeth and rent our garments. And decided to just keep talking to each other and figuring out new ways to do things. And then it wasn't my idea, but I definitely was along for the ride. Mary Kay said, hey, let's talk about what we're talking about, which was publishing and writing and resistance. Oh my gosh, the resistance that comes up during COVID because our brains are so preoccupied literally with survival that writing is so much harder. I don't, I might be alone in this. I mean, raise your hand, amen, sister, if you've had more trouble writing this year than any other year. And it's because our brains are, are back here trying to solve a problem. Are we going to survive? What do we do? I'm isolated. How am I going to? And so to try and dive into creativity. So we started talking about those things to each other. And Mary Kay said, let's just put it on my Facebook because um, she has a cute, much bigger following than the rest of us. And we did. And people were joining by the droves and chiming in on the conversation. So we made a separate Facebook page called Friends in Fiction. And um, it is now, we are on show 42, show number 42. That's, that's how long it takes to have a baby, 42 weeks. Every Wednesday night, we, um, once a month we talk, just the five of us. And then every Wednesday night we have a guest. Um, we had William Kent Kruger last week. We had Kristen Hanna, Lisa Winget. We've talked, next week is, um, we're talking about debuts and we have three debut authors popping in to talk about what it's like to have a debut during a pandemic. And every week is a different subject and every week is a different author. And it play, it's live every Wednesday night, but you can watch it all week. And then it's live on YouTube, but they're all stored on a YouTube channel. So, you know, everything from poets to novelists to nonfiction, even though it's called friends and fiction. And, um, our one year anniversary is in April and we have Jody Picot. So it's been astounding to watch it grow. And it's not because we're so great. It's because of what we're all talking about here, which is this need for community, that our creative lives are such a part of our real life that when, when the world shut down and said, you can't gather, we were desperate and that's the word to find ways to gather. And so what we didn't realize we were tapping into is this need to talk about story with each other, which goes back to the beginning, we are wired for story. And 
So without realizing what we were doing, we were tapping into that idea of that we're wired for story and community and to talk about story. And this community, men and women, ha it's now I think we're up to 28,000 members are desperate to do what we, we have been doing and not because of us, but because of the power of story. Mm -hmm. That's great. So uh, the floor is open for discussion. You guys feel free to unmute yourselves if you would like to ask questions or whatever. Yeah, what do y'all want to talk about? Oh, come on. Well, Patty, I guess this goes with the, the friends in fiction, but how do you feel about online events now for the, for the future with tours and things like that? Oh, KK, I have such a mixed bag of feelings about it. I mean, I think we can all raise our hands and say we're such a mixed bag of feelings about everything lately. There's too many feelings going on. But um, I think that that there's really some good in it. I think a lot of us were running too hard and too fast. And being on the road is stressful on your body, on your creativity, on your writing. Um, and yet, I mean, I'm a people person. I want to gather. I want to hug you. I want to sit down over a glass of wine and talk about the stories you're working on. And there's only so much we can do virtually. And yet I hope in the future, there's some kind of hybrid situation where we can gather. Like Haley was talking about how many people have been able to come to this conference from other states, even outside the country because we're doing it on Zoom. So I hope that as the world slowly opens up that we can do a hybrid of this where maybe we gather, but people can Zoom in now that we know how to do it. Um, I don't know, I think it's gonna change the way we live in a lot of ways. And I give a lot of thought to the uh, this idea of fear. Has this made us more fearful? to be around other people? Is it going to change how we feel about gathering together? And I, I think it can't help but change it somewhat, but I, I, I just pray it doesn't change us permanently. Um, I pray that we can take the best of, of this new technology we found and use it without letting it isolate us even more than we already are. Um, but I think as far as book tours, KK, I think they're changed irrevocably. I, I think book tours have changed for good and all. Just like I think a lot of people have discovered they can work from home um, and, and aren't going back to their offices. My brother-in-law works in, in New York City. He was, you know, had a three hour commute on a train every day to go into the city. He says he'll never do it again, right? So it's not only changing us irrevocably in that way, but I think it's changing book tours dramatically. I can't imagine, again, being put out on the road for a six or seven week tour when we're discovering how many more people we can reach this way. So I do think it's changed that for us. And do you feel different about it, KK? Like, do you feel like um, you'd want to get back out. I mean, how, how does it feel to you? On I mean, I'm dying to have a glass of wine with you at your house. I know, right? Yeah. Um, so I want all that social interaction again, but I have discovered that, um, being able to come in, I mean, I'm in a little writing shed now I have. Um, oh, that's so nice. Um, but it's been so nice to be able to, uh, dial in to yeah. conversations and workshops and things like that so easily and so quickly. So I'm, I'm kind of hoping that there's going to be a hybrid that, that this type of event will stick around. I definitely don't want it to dominate. There you go. And I think if for those of us who are writing like you are and Jennifer with her poetry is, is um, I have been able to focus in some ways more than I did. If you're not thinking about what city am I in? Where have I woken up? Where I need, like, even with this, you know, this is in Birmingham, it, it would have been fine. I would have been home in 10 minutes, but you know, the travel, it does take away from what does matter, which is the work, right? We're here because we want to write and we want to write better and we want to write deeper. And so 
I, I do think a hybrid is, is, is how, how about you, Haley? Does it feel like this is going to change things for good now? Oh, I hope not. Um, this is so lacking in that energy that I so desire. Yeah. You know, I like to be the person in a crowded room where, you know, the buzz is going and everything like that. And I like to scout the room and, you know, find that one friend, talk to them for a while and then switch on over to the other. But it's, I mean, this doesn't replace yep. anything for me. It's just, it helps support. Like if we didn't have this, I'd have nothing, right? I would not have. No, nothing. right, yeah. right. Right. I, and I think about that a lot. What, you know, in a different age, even 20 years ago, when I first started writing, if, if we'd gone on this kind of lockdown, it would have been an abyss. It would have been just silence, um, echoing silence. We all would have gone a little bit more crazy than maybe we already have. Um, we did have a question in the chat, so it's uh, from Margaret, but your research is so thorough and meticulous, and I'm wondering, do you mm. have any tips for historical fiction writers and the sometimes daunting task of research? Oh, wow. That is such a great question, and um, I swear we could do a two-day workshop on that, so I'll, I'll just give you my thoughts. I love research, so I think if you're going to write historical fiction, you have to you don't have to, but it helps if you really love research. I love following my curiosity. I, I've always believed that if we follow what we're curious about, we're led to the things we might supposed to be writing about or, or the things that will mean something to somebody else. So for me, research has always been about me following my curiosity and then diving really deep and falling down some rabbit holes, which is actually the biggest detriment to historical fiction is that I have to decide really early on what my touchstone is or what the cornerstone of the story is because I can become so enamored with a, a small piece of research, like a walk, what you see on the walk from Oxford to the Bodleian Library. And, and I'll spend two days so I can describe that to you and, and put in two sentences. So I have to be really careful. And I think a great question to ask yourself when you're doing the research is, and sometimes you don't know yet what the cornerstone of your story is. And that's cool. Just keep following your curiosity. But um, I have piles. This whole row right here is nothing and a little bit down here is nothing but books about um becoming mrs lewis and over there that you can't see i have a whole row about the shipwreck i just wrote about that comes out in march and so i research and i research and i research and i read what i'm curious about and what touches the cornerstone of the story so for example mrs lewis the cornerstone was how in the world did these two unlikely people come together. If I started getting in a rabbit hole of, of Joy's six months in writing screenplays in Hollywood, which by the way, is really interesting, I had to put it down because it didn't matter to the core of the story. For the shipwreck, I had the, the cornerstone of that story is how did they survive and how did they survive the surviving? So I needed to, every time I got into a a rabbit trail about this family from Savannah and some of the things they did and what happened to their children, I had to pull myself back. But if it had to do with the history of Savannah and why these people were the way they are, I let myself fall down that rabbit hole. Um, I have an Audible original that came out a couple weeks ago. It's a short story called Wild Swan about Florence Nightingale. And same thing, her life, her biographies are this thick. I was only writing about a six month period in her life when she realized she wanted to be a nurse and had to buck her family and society to do it. Because at that time, nurses were, they were like janitors. They were, they were considered, um, it, it was not considered, it was considered below the station of her Victorian aristocratic upbringing. I had to stop myself from researching the Crimean war, why she went, I had to stick with that. So. My advice is, is twofold in that. One is to spend some time figuring out what the touchstone is so that you can decide what you actually have to research. And the other is to follow your curiosity. 
Um, and then I have one more piece. You can't find everything on Google. The very best things that I found for my stories were by digging through boxes in history centers, in reading rooms, in interviews, in um, museums. Oh my gosh, especially for surviving Savannah, the museums in Savannah gave me information I would have never found on Google or in a book, artifacts, displays. So my, my third piece of advice for research is to go beyond Google and books and get your hands dirty in the reading rooms and the history centers and the museums. What's been sort of like the strangest thing to happen with you in your course of research um, for any of your books? Oh, so many. Oh my gosh. Um, so I'll give you a recent one. When I was writing, it's kind of spooky. And I, you're writers, so I can say this to you. I probably wouldn't say this to a room full of readers, but don't you feel like sometimes when you're writing, the story tells you it wants to be told? Can I get a raised hand, like it, it, it wants to come through you. It wants to be told. Okay, so I would was just thinking about writing about this steamship called the steamship Pulaski that sank in 1838, with all the elite of Savannah and Charleston on it. Not all the elite, but all the passengers with the elite of Savannah and Charleston on it. Blew up off the coast of North Carolina, and sank. Um, and the people who did survive, most of them survived by floating for five days and five nights at sea. Nobody came looking for them. So assuming that they were all dead. And so when I first started writing about it, I was mildly curious about it, then more curious and started doing my research. And I hit the search bar on my computer trying to discover you know, more information. And this headline popped up that said, Steamship Pulaski found after almost 200 years at the 100 feet deep, 30 miles off the coast of Wilmington. The ship I was writing about, somebody else was trying to find. And I had no idea. I was digging up the story while they were actually digging up the actual remains. So of course the story shifted 100% because now I wanna tell a modern day tale too about bringing up these artifacts and gold and silver and, and a pocket watch with the face blown out at the exact time of the explosion. They found that at the bottom of the ocean 200 years later. And then the second thing that happened with that that was just set me back in my chair was um, I decided to write the whole thing from women's points of view for obvious reasons. And also because shipwreck tales are usually told from the captain's point of view or the, or the male point of view. I wanted to tell it from a woman's point of view and, and how would they try to survive without knowing navigation or, or how to get to shore or any of that. And I had found in the Atlanta History Center, I had found an, a handwritten account of that night by this woman named Rebecca Lamar. And so I decided to focus on her family of 11. They all boarded the ship together, 11 people from the same family boarded this ship. Ship. And I had a handwritten account from her. The shipwreck divers have only found one luggage tag, one brass plate luggage tag, and it's hers. Rebecca Lamar in script on a luggage tag. They brought that up and I had spent the last year and a half writing from her point of view. And maybe I'm woo woo crazy, but I felt like she was saying, keep going. And they have not found another luggage tag with a name on it yet. So that's pretty cool. But I do think that those hints, if we pay attention and listen quietly, do, do happen. And that goes back to the letting our real life and our creative life merge so that we are always paying attention. And, and I'm talking to myself, I'm preaching to my own choir because I forget too, so. Wow. Anyone have any questions? Anybody else wanna know anything? You may have just answered this question, but how do you determine, when do you determine what the touchstone is, what the cornerstone of a story is going to be? Mm. That is such a great question because sometimes it takes a lot more time 
than than others. I immediately knew what the touchstone was for becoming Mrs. Lewis. It took me a lot longer for surviving Savannah. So I think the only way through it is through it. So if there's something you're curious about, like I was about this shipwreck and, and what happened to the people, the more I kept going, the more, I, it was not until I discovered, so I call the touchstone something else too, the door into the story, right? Sometimes we know we wanna tell a story, but we don't know what the door into the story is. And if we sit there and wait for the door into the story before we start writing, maybe that book will never get written. Because sometimes the only way to find the door into the story is to just keep writing, like to grope through this dark tunnel and try to find the story. And what happened when I was doing my research is I found out about this family of 11. And I found out that the oldest son, his name was, um, the father's name was Gazaway Bug Lamar. You just can't make up these 1800s names. And his son was Charles Augustus Lafayette Lamar. And Charles Augustus Lafayette Lamar was 14 years old when that ship blew up and he was on it. Um, I'm not giving anything away. It's in chapter three. He, he survives and he was 14 years old. He survives five days and five nights at sea. 20 years later, and, and, and he helped so many people that he earned the nickname, a noble boy. 20 years later, he had a new nickname and it was the red devil. He had flaming red hair and, and he was a horror in Savannah. He ended up being a slave trader. He ended up commandeering the penultimate slave ship called the Wanderer to the Congo to bring back 400 enslaved men, women, and children from the Congo. And he was a horror and he died the last man to die in the Civil War shot through the heart from his horse in Columbus, Georgia, six days after Lee had already surrendered to App at Appomattox. So he got his just desserts. But when I found that story, I knew what the book was about. And the, what the book was about was, what do we do with our survival? What do we do with our lives when we've been spared or survive? So the question I had pinned to my monitor and my bulletin board was, how do we survive the surviving? And that was my touchstone for the rest of the book, which is anything that had to do with what, what we choose to do with our lives. I was, I was questioning the, the kind of mythology around everything is meant to be, or you were meant to survive. Or So why did he survive when he did such damage in the world? Was he meant to survive? Um, and if he was, why did he do what he did? Why, what, 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 where's the, in, and these are too big a questions to ever answer completely, but where is the intersection between meant to be and free will? Um, and I think those kind of questions can only be answered in story. So that took me a while. I was writing for about a year, muddling in the dark with this story. I almost gave up a couple of times until I found that touchstone and door into the story. So I hope that helps because. I, I, I don't sit down and say, oh, this is my, this is what's going to be my, my ground stone and I'm never going to veer. I, I mean, I'm all over the place, just like the rest of us until I know. And sometimes that just takes some time. Does that help? Julie? Yes, it did. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Actually, I was wondering, um, all right science fiction and fantasy <laughs> um, i love science fiction and fantasy if i tried to write it it would be it would be about as good as my poetry well i just think that similar to you what you i was i was struggling with cornerstone too so i was thankful mm. for that question and that def, that explanation um and for me it's often the what ifs what yes. if this was different and it's about a person's life or about a about the world how the world works about different universes. So um, I don't yep. know if that's similar or not. And I don't know if I need to kind of refine my what ifs into t cornerstones, but um, I, I think a what if is a cornerstone. Literally, I think it's the same language. I think it's the same word for the same thing. Um, what if, because you're doing something more speculative, I'm looking backwards, right? You're looking forwards. What if this happened? I'm looking back and saying, what already happened and what does it mean for us? 
but I think the what if is a cornerstone. I think it it, it is a touch point. Um, it's one of those things that the net of story catches for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> and yeah, I agree. Because my what if for my story that I'm working on, it's turning out to be a saga is what if when we fell into the water, it wasn't the water that killed us, but fear. Oh, and that see, I got chill bumps. On, a, yeah. on an adventure. So I'm still working on it. <laughs> oh, right. So, right. That's, there's a whole story in there. And, and one of my favorite poets is David White. He's an Irish philosopher and poet, kind of a protege of um, John O'Donohue, who is kind of my guru that I never met. But um, he has this whole poem that I've tried to memorize. I'm a terrible memorizer. But it's about asking the beautiful question and that if we ask better questions, we get better answers. And I love applying that to our stories too. So what happened to the family is a good question, but how, do they, how did they survive the surviving is a better question. Your what if, that question, what if we just didn't drown from water is a good question, but the way you took it and turned it into what if it was the fear is a better question. So the better our questions, the more, or in his words, the more beautiful the question, the more beautiful the answers. So I think that when we are writing our stories, I like thinking about the beautiful question. I like thinking about that. Um, we do have a question in the chat uh, or Rather, does anyone have a recommendation regarding the best way to find a writer's group? I think that's on you, Haley. <laughs> right? Um, so we do have the Birmingham Area Writers, which is the online writer's group. We try to use that as a, sort of a gathering spot to kind of disperse people from there. It's more of like a connection point. Right. Uh, and then I am putting together a resources page on the Spark Writing Festival uh, Web page that is sort of, um, you know, different publications you could be a part of, the local available writing groups and things of that nature. So hopefully that'll be a good resource for you guys going forward. Awesome. Um, what, uh, what hobbies do you do when you're not writing? Like, what are your other interests? <laughs> God, I hate that question because I am so boring. Um, are reading and writing. Um, I love travel, but obviously that hobby is not happening right now. And I actually really do, you know how sometimes you get asked the question, what would you do if you weren't writing? Um, aside from being a nurse, which is what I used to be, is um, I do love interior design things. So I am a little obsessed when I need my brain to shut down a little bit what, you know, scrolling through interior design sites and trying to find interesting things. And, um, and that probably is what I would do or try to do if I wasn't writing. But um, John Mays is this, is this ex um, sales rep that has this blog called Advanced Reader's Copy. And he had my, has my home on it today or the cleaned up parts of my home on it today and and I do love gathering um, meaningful things and, and putting them in, in a vignette and trying to make my living space um, reflect what I care about. But honest to God, reading and writing is my hobby. When I'm not writing, I'm reading. And if I'm not reading, I'm writing. And if I'm not, if I'm doing research or reading something else, it's usually because it has to do with what I'm writing. And I don't know where the original phrase for this was, but my old agent said it once and it stuck with me forever, which is writing might not be a really good way to make a living, but it is a really good way to make a life. I like that. Yeah. I'm writing it down. Oh, okay. <laughs> writing might not be a really good way to make a living, but it's a really good way to make a life. So it's kind of my hobby. I'm a one, one, one show pony, one, one pony show, one, whatever that saying is. So then what are you reading right now? One trick pony. That's it. Um, 
what? Oh gosh, I'm reading so many things right now. Most of them are advanced reader copies um, for, you know, blurb or for the show. Um, I'm looking over there. Oh gosh, you know what I love that just came out last week is Nick by Michael Ferris Smith. So good. It is, um, it is the prequel for The Great Gatsby about Nick Carraway. It is, and I love Michael Ferris Smith. He, he usually writes like gritty fiction, like gritty, he wrote The Fighter and Blackwood, gritty Southern fiction. And this is his first four way, four, yes, that into, into something, um, a modern take on a literary classic. Um, there is a debut coming out next week by a woman named Pamela Terry called The Sweet Taste of Muscadines. And it is, um, this is what it looks like. And she has been writing for years and years and years. She is proof that it is never too late to try and publish your first novel. Um, I'm about to dive into Lisa Scottolini is taking her first dip into um, historical fiction in a book called Eternal. And then Don, I noticed you wrote about Rachel Hawkins' new book. Um, what's it called? The, the something wife, the, the wife upstairs, the wife upstairs. And our friends in fiction also has a podcast and we are interviewing her on Monday about that book. And it's, it's a retake of Jane Eyre set in Mountain Brook. So I'm really excited to dig into that this weekend because we're interviewing her on Monday, but that's what I'm reading. I could go on and on and on, but, and I always have one on audio and one on my iPad and one on my bookshelf. So I'm rarely without something and usually reading two or three things at the same time. So I'd love to hear what y'all are reading that you love. If you want to stick it in, in the chat, I would love suggestions. And that's one of my favorite things about the Friends in Fiction Facebook page is that I hear about books I would normally not hear about and have found some really great ones, um, especially debuts. In this time, it's really hard to get the word out about debuts. And we have been really um, focused on trying to make sure we look for the big buzz right now is for a debut called The Kindest Lie by Nancy Johnson. Um, I have it, I haven't read it yet, but it's it's got a lot of buzz. So it's hard to get attention at all during this time when the world kind of looks like a, a backyard brawl um, or even bigger, honestly, that, that to try and get the word out about these books I think is really important. But yeah, list them and I'll go back and make the list of things I wanna read. Great. So Marie Sutton is on with us and she says, do you write your books all the way first and edit them or do you edit them along the way? Um, I write them all the way through first. Um, I, I try to go the, by the old adage of, of uh, the Anne Lamott, the shitty first draft. I really do just try to get the story out. Now, I do stop sometimes and go backwards when it hits me what the story is really about, which like I said, sometimes takes some time. So I will stop and go back and then start to outline a little bit because I'm not a big outliner. I've become more of one with historical fiction than I was with my contemporary fiction, much more obviously, because I need to make timelines and dates and, and facts and make sure that I don't have Joy Davidman reading um, Mere Christianity when he hasn't even written it yet. So I have to have timelines, but um, I usually try and write, it's usually about the third of the way through when I see what it's about, sometimes half the way through. And then I will stop and try to build an outline and try to decide where I've been and where I'm going. But I don't go back and start editing. I don't, that's phase two for me. I have friends who, and listen, you could line up a hundred of us and you're gonna get a hundred different answers. Um, I have friends who always read the previous day's work and edit it before starting on that day's work. I, it's such a different part of my brain for me that I can't kick both in at the same time. 
So I'm either writing or I'm cleaning up and editing. And if I take time from creating the story to fix the story, it's harder for me to get back into making the story. So I try as best I can to write it from beginning to end. I'm not religious about it. Um, I'm not, I, I don't have hard and fast rules that I make myself stick to. It's just the natural way that I do it. If I feel like I need to stop and go back, I will. Um, especially if I had to put it down for a little while. Um, for example, I had to put Surviving Savannah down for a little while when Mrs. Lewis came out and I was on the road. And I did go back and read what I'd written and try and find my way again. But I prefer not to do it that way. I'm so glad you're here, Marie. I wish I could meet you in real life yeah. someday. Um, Brian has a story, uh, question. For books like the Savannah story, where do you draw the line between needing permission from families, et cetera, and a story being so historical that you don't need permission? I feel like that could get really confusing. No, that's not confusing at all. And it's a really big question in, in historical fiction. Um, so there's two different answers. I'll try to make them brief because I think we're out of time. But um, for example, the Becoming Mrs. Lewis is about two very real people. I quote them, I quote their work, I talk about their life. They are two very real people. So I had to get permission whenever I quoted them. You can write about whoever you want. Don't slander them, you can get sued. Um, but you can't, you can't use their quotes without permission, usually. So for example, um, this Nick story by Michael Ferris Smith about Nick Carraway before the Great Gatsby. He had to wait until the copyright expired in 2021. And this book came out on January 5th of 2021. So, you know, he had to wait for certain copyrights. For me, um, I had to go to the C.S. Lewis company and family. There's one remaining stepson who runs, helps run the C.S. Lewis company and get permission for the quotes that I used. Um, and and pay for pay for them. They they didn't. He loved the book so much. He it was a pittance, and it could have been much bigger. And I could have published that book without their permission, but I would have had to take out all her poetry. And her poetry starts every chapter. And I would have had to take out anything real that they said. So I could have done it, but it's much better to do it with permission. Now on the flip side, there's Surviving Savannah. That story's two hundred years old, not. 50 years old. And that story is about a very real family, the Gazaway Bug Lamar family, but I changed their name and I changed the, some of their destinies. And in, in doing that, I can say that the Gazaway Bug Lamar family was the inspiration for the family in surviving Savannah. I don't have to get permission for that. I don't use their names. I don't, you know, everything I do talk about that's factual is public record. I don't quote them. Um, I do use a couple quotes from Rebecca's journal about that night, but it's 200 years old. It's fair use. So it, it depends on how who you're writing about and how much of their name you're using and how much of real life they're using. you're using. For Florence Nightingale, same thing. It was fair use. It was things that had been published, things she'd said, biographies about her. And it was a short story, so I wasn't diving into any big family secrets or anything, but, well, a little bit, but it's no good without family secrets. But yeah, so it, it depends on, I hope that answers, but it really depends on how close you're writing about someone and how close you're just using someone for inspiration and don't use their name in the book. There were absolutely no permissions except for a poem I put in the front that I needed for Surviving Savannah, where I had a months long back and forth for permissions in the other one so does that make sense does that answer your question okay good <laughs> all right cool does anyone else have any questions for patty anything you want to say you're more than welcome to meet yourself mm -hmm. yeah well, thank you for joining me this morning i was like oh it's just going to be me and Haley staring at each other on the screen having a chat but you guys showed up. Thank you. It shows how much we all need each other. This is a really crazy time. I was honored to be here. And listen, Haley has my email. If you have a question you didn't want to spurt out, I'm super easy to find. So thanks for having me, y'all. Absolutely.
Thank you so much, Patty, for being with us. Thank you to all of our participants. Um, this has been a wonderful closing of the Spark Writing Festival that y'all have made this week. Fantastic for me. Um, everyone in the English department is so pleased. So thank you. And we will have more Spark events in the future. So stay tuned for those. But in the meantime, um, this was recorded. So I will have this up and posted. If you want to share with anyone who may have missed out on that, you're more than welcome to. And then, uh, like Patty said, if you have any questions for her, I can get y'all connected. So yeah. thanks, everyone. Hey, thanks for pulling this together, sweetie. Appreciate it. Absolutely. All right. All right, y'all. Have a good Saturday. Bye.